Well, hello there and welcome to the Disability Law Show. John Scholes, Savannah Tamark and James Farman back once again to fill your head with lots of amazing knowledge about disability law and injury law. Um, coming up today on the show, we will get to three ways to deal with an aggressive or bullying disability adjuster. I know these guys want to sink their teeth into that for sure. But I uh, want to mention off the top the pocket employment lawyer. That's, it has to do with employment, hence the name. But there's a section in the employment uh, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca website that deals with disability law, right? Absolutely. And again, for people who we haven't watched the show before. We are disability lawyers. We deal with long-term disability claims. We fight for individuals against insurance companies. But our firm, uh, and we have offices in Ontario and in BC, we also do a lot of employment law. And in fact, we find that a lot of people who have issues with their insurance company, with their disability insurer, also have issues with their employer. Uh, and so we came up with this new uh, website, pocketemploymentlawyer.ca, that really gives you uh, it, the basics, the answers that you need mm -hmm. to at least start off considering whether or not you have a case on the employment side, but also on the long-term disability side. It's almost like a uh, uh, um, virtual reality type of a, of a tool, right? It's basically, sorry, uh, artificial intelligence type tool. Right. Uh, very, very basic. Instead of Googling your question and trying to get answers, probably going to be wrong answers on Google, <laughs> you go to pocketemployment.ca, it's anonymous, it's free. You input a few key pieces of information, not your name, not your phone number, but your, whatever your issue is, whether it's employment or disability related. And then that uh, website will give you a very quick analysis. It will give you a starting point to consider whether or not you may have a case. And it's fantastic, John, because not everyone wants to call a lawyer, not everyone wants to email a lawyer, even though we tell people it's gonna cost you nothing to speak with us. That is a fantastic starting point. So if you have an issue, with your disability insurance company or an employment issue, go to pocketemploymentlawyer.ca and uh, just use it. It'll take you 20 seconds and you'll have a good starting point and a good understanding of what uh, your case is about. And again, it is anonymous, but there is a contact button at the bottom and the top. And if you want to reach out now, by the way, the phone number 1-855-821-5900 and help at disabilityrights.ca. Week that was, what do you got for us? John, again, very, very busy week for James and I. Uh, let me tell you about uh, this gentleman who had emailed me and, and he's actually from uh, British Columbia, from Vancouver. Uh, he's 53 years old. He, uh, he's got four kids under 10. Uh, he, uh, he, he's a laboratory technician, or at least he's done that for the last two decades. And uh, he doesn't just sit down. The nature of the job is, is a bit more physical than that. Uh, about a year and a half ago, he had a stroke and he suffered paralysis, but also some issues, uh, cognitive issues with, with his brain, uh, memory issues, focus issues, etc. And with rehab, he's gotten better on the physical side. Yeah. And he has been on long-term disability for about a year or so. And the insurance adjuster uh, talked to him last week and said, you know, we think that in about a year, you're gonna be good enough to do another job. So let me explain to people why this is important. Uh, it's important because for most long-term disability claims, under most long-term disability policies, to get LTD, to get those benefits for the first two years, you have to be disabled from doing your own occupation. Okay? Yep. Beyond the two-year mark, the test becomes, can you do any occupation for which you're suited for by training, education, or experience? Now, this gentleman has made some strides. He's been uh, uh, a bit better now uh, physically, but not cognitively. And his doctors have said that they don't have an end date for that. They have no idea when he'll be able to go back to any type of work. But the insurance adjuster is already suggesting that in a year, imagine that, the insurance adjuster has a crystal ball here. In a year, they wow. think that he may be able to do something else. That is a red flag. That is a warning sign. It tells me that they are priming his case to potentially cut him off at the two-year mark or just before that, which is when we see a lot of people getting cut off benefits. So what I told them is, keep doing what you're doing, do your rehab, make sure you give updated reports from your doctors to the insurance adjuster. As long as your doctors are saying that you cannot go and do any job, any occupation, whether it's yours or any, any other occupation, you are okay. And if they tell you that they're gonna cut you off, if they give you a date that they're gonna cut you off by, you, you tell us immediately because we'll be able to go after the insurance company and force them to either extend that or, in fact, bring a legal claim and, and, and get a, a more global resolution of your claim. But he should not be 
he should not be subjected to that by the insurance company. You know, th this is actually a perfect example of why it's so important to have an experienced lawyer on your side when you're dealing with a disability claim. Because this two-year test, this test that changes after the two-year mark to whether or not you can do any occupation, if you, if the insurance company says that you don't meet that test, that you are able to do some other occupation, they may suggest to you that you can do something uh, that is less cognitively challenging for this gentleman's case. Um, you know, perhaps you know, working a retail job or, or something of that nature. And he might well be able to do that. That might be a fair thing for them to say. You can go back and do this job and you could even maybe do, do it full time if physically you're capable of doing it. But that actually doesn't mean that the insurance company gets off the hook and that's not something you would know by reading the policy that's actually something that was created by judges it's called the common law and there's a principle that says that you are entitled to continue getting your benefits even if you can return to full-time work if the jobs that you're capable of doing won't pay you commensurate income and they define that as being basically about 60% of what you had been earning before, more or less the equivalent of what you're getting in your LTD benefits. And so if you're not able to essentially replace those LTD benefits with employment income, you're still entitled to get those benefits. So this is really an issue for people who are earning particularly high salary jobs. If you're making $100,000, $150,000, $200,000 a year, it doesn't matter if you can go back to a minimum wage job. That doesn't get the insurer off the hook. Right. But you're not going to know that unless either you are reading all of the judge's decisions that have come out over the last 10, 15 years and you're really keeping up on it, or unless you've hired an experienced lawyer to help you with your disability claim. It seems weird that he got this this notification a year out. You said crystal ball. That's like that's like a Times Square <laughs> New Year's Eve ball size. Is that normal to be a year away saying we're going to take you off claim? Yeah, I, I don't know. If it seems a little unfair. Yeah, it, it, well, it's definitely unfair. It, it's not something we see that I don't see that that often a year in advance. Yeah. I'll see four months, I, five months, six months. I actually disagree. I think I, I think from that perspective, in terms of notice. If they're going to do it anyway, I'm very happy that they've given see, this guy a year's oh, yeah, worth no, no, of notice. But, but, but do you see that often as being... Oh, no. I, I, I it's, mean, it's very unusual, but it's actually really helpful yes. in this case because if they make that decision... Now, it doesn't. I, I'm not sure if the language that they use was definitive in this case. No, it wasn't definitive. We think we, you, you should be able to. So you're gearing up for it. But the moment that they actually tell you that they're going to cut you off, then you start a claim right then and there. And so the hope is that they do it sooner than later. But, yeah, you know, the fact that they're doing it this early, you know, that can really work to your advantage if they, in fact, follow through on that right. and cut you off. Because it shows that well before they were in any position to actually evaluate what your condition was at the point they cut you off, they were already working towards that decision. Thanks for the heads up. Right. And yeah. that's actually a, a really big issue. And that can expose gotcha. them to punitive damages. One eight five five eight two one fifty nine hundred is the uh, number to reach out. Email is help at disabilityrights.ca. Guys, I want to get to one that we're uh, we're rolling along here. This email is from Mark. It says, "My wife told me that her long-term disability payments will stop in about two and a half months because of transferable skills analysis assessment." It's a mouthful that her insurer had her do to uh, conclude that she could do some other type of work. We spoke with a friend of ours who's a lawyer, but he doesn't deal with disability claims. He offered to help us appeal the decision. Obviously, he doesn't do disability work. Uh, our concern is that the adjuster made it clear when he spoke to my wife that the insurance company won't likely change their mind because they think that her disease is not that severe. Her doctors disagree and think that she uh, can't do any job at this point. What do you guys suggest? Well, you know, first of all, I want to go through some of the language that's being used okay. here and debunk some of the, the some of this and explain this to the viewers. So, a transferable skills analysis. All that means is that the insurance company hires someone to assess your ability to do other jobs. Gotcha. So, what is your training, education, and experience, and what jobs would that qualify you to do? based on your medical profile, based on whatever limitations you have physically or psychologically. Mm -hmm. So based on all of those factors, what are the available jobs for you? And it will spit out, you know, based on these very broad categories, potential jobs that you may be able to do. So that's all it really is. Now, there are many ways, even if that shows that you're capable of doing certain things, there are still many ways to challenge that. First and foremost, I always take a look at, okay, well, who's doing this assessment? As often as not, it's somebody who 
has very questionable credentials and usually someone who's a full-time employee of the insurance company. So there's issues of bias and there's issue of credibility and qualifications off the, uh, off the, off the outset. But then you also have to take a look at, okay, well, this is what we were talking about before. What do those jobs pay? And are they going to pay sufficiently to prevent you from being able to earn enough money to no longer satisfy that test? In other words, are you going to be making 60% of the income that you had been making before? And a lot of times you'll see the transferable skills analysis and it'll say that you can do these jobs, but then you'll never see the next step, the analysis of how much would that pay. <laughs> and you don't see the, the occasions where you don't see that next step invariably are the occasions where when you do the next step, it would show that you wouldn't be making enough and you would still be qualified for the benefits. So that's number one. That's all the transferable skills analysis is. It is nothing that worries me in the least when I see it in a file. It's usually pretty meaningless at the end of the day. The other two issues, and I think these are the bigger issues in Mark's email here. Number one, when you're trying to deal with a long-term disability matter, it's critical that you get help from someone who knows what they're doing. It's absolutely imperative that you do it. There are so many things that you need to know and really understand in order to make sure that you're going down the right path. And I mentioned right at the beginning, and I've talked about it again in this email, this idea of commensurate income, that unless they can show you're able to do a job after two years that's going to pay you commensurate income, then they still have to pay you the benefits. And unless you're working in this field or you're watching the show now, you're not going to understand that. So that's really critical. And I have a feeling that the gentleman that or or perhaps lady that they've gone to uh, in order to get legal advice about uh, about Mark's wife's claim is not necessarily someone who's an expert and I say that because he suggested he help them with the appeal, appeal. Yep. and you know that's something that we talk about on every show and we'll talk about it now don't appeal don't appeal. Every time you're denied or cut off benefits, the insurance company is going to invite you to, ap to appeal, and that sounds like it's an opportunity. It sounds like, oh, okay, well, perhaps I'm going to get this change, this, you know, this formal process, this appeal. No, that's not what it is. It is an internal process. The rules for the appeal are completely arbitrary. The insurance company decides on the entire process, and the person deciding the appeal is, in most cases, going to be the same person that made the decision. In some cases, it might be their direct manager or supervisor, but it's still someone who has the exact same motivations to deny or cut off your benefits. It's pretty rough. You don't want to do that, right? The appeal thing. No. We talk about no. it every week. Just no. don't get it done. No, absolutely don't. Yeah. And, and those that do and have watched the show, they come back to us and say, you were right. Yeah. 1-855-821-5900 is the number. Three ways to deal with an aggressive or bullying disability adjuster. That is coming up after a short break on the Disability Law Show. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to disabilityrights.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Welcome back to the Disability Law Show to reach out 1-855-821-5900, disabilityrights.ca. Guys, want to get to this, and I know you guys want to answer all three of these. Three ways to deal with an aggressive or bullying disability adjuster. Number one is this. I uh, didn't know you could do this. Ask for the manager and request a different case manager for your claim. You can absolutely do that. But before I even get to that, let yep. me just say that this is something that we do here quite often. Sometimes people uh, are, are just in a vulnerable state, so they perceive the adjuster to be aggressive. Uh, 
but not, you know, it's not necessarily the, the, the situation that the adjuster is aggressive. But in other instances, I've actually seen emails back and forth. Uh, and James will get to the whole email and the whole documentary record issue. Uh, but I've seen emails from adjusters that are unequivocal uh, in that, that they're bullying, that they're aggressive. They have no right to be aggressive towards you. Uh, as, as a disabled individual, uh, it's not part of their job description, and, and, and frankly, they should be called up on it. And one of the ways to do that, and you may not be in a position to do that, you may need a spouse or somebody who helps you to do that with you or for you, is request a different adjuster or speak with the manager. I mean, in any situation, not just in a disability, in the disability world, but if you're dealing with government, you're dealing with a corporation, any corporation, insurance companies or corporations, if you're having issues with the first line people you're dealing with, you can go higher up. You can ask for a manager, right? You can, you can ask for someone. And there's, there's nothing unusual about asking uh, for a different case manager. I'm not saying you're always going to get one, but the fact that you've put that request in, I mean, that already gives you that there, there's, there's a possibility you'll get somebody else who's not going to be acting in a way that they should not be acting, in a bullying way or an aggressive way. But the point of the matter is that you should not have to be dealing with an aggressive or a bullying adjuster. That is not, it's not supposed to happen. And if it is happening to you, especially if you're dealing with mental health issues that can really aggravate your condition, you should 100% ask for someone else. You know, you mentioned that it's not part of their job description to be aggressive or bullying. Well, that's absolutely true, but I would go a step further. It's, in fact, something that they're explicitly not supposed to right. do. Insurance companies and their employees have a duty to act in good faith towards their claimants, towards the insured people. Um, and what that means, at the very least, is it, you're entitled to be treated with respect. You're entitled to not be bullied, to not be um, dreading every time the phone rings that you're going to have to deal with this person and their aggression. So yeah, they absolutely cannot do that. It's totally inappropriate. And where judges find that insurance companies have acted that way, they get very angry. And usually that's when you see awards of punitive damages where the insurance companies are made to pay not just the benefits, but also an amount on top of that to punish them for the way that they've acted. And at that, that point is something I was going to ask. If you do make that request for another case manager, make a record of it because it could come into play later on if it ends up being with you guys in front of a judge, right? Well, I, think I asked for someone nice because this guy was a bully and he was making my That's the second well, attorney, attorney, Yeah, right? you're stepping on yeah, number two, two oh, yeah, There you are. That's number exactly two, didn't it. read ahead. Uh, <laughs> confirm your request in writing and ask for all your previous correspondence with the insurer. How about that? Well done. I think I'm hired. You, yeah, exactly. So this is, <laughs> this is really critical and it's something that people don't understand how important it really right. is because you're in the moment and you're having this discussion and you figure, okay, well, if I say that that should be good enough. It's not. You need a record of it and you need it right. in writing. So here is what I recommend that everybody does when you're on a disability, when you have a disability claim and you're dealing with your adjuster. Even if it hasn't gone down this road, even if your adjuster is treating you friendly and with respect, it is a very good idea every time your adjuster calls to say, can you just hold on for a minute? I would like to take some notes, mm -hmm. get a pad of paper and a pen, and just write down everything that's being said. It doesn't have to be a verbatim transcript, but make sure you have the substance of everything that is said by you and by them. When that conversation is over, you immediately write an email to the adjuster summarizing the conversation. You're doing nothing more. You're not trying to shade it one way or the other. However, if you are feeling bullied, if you feel that the adjuster was aggressive with you, I would also add that in that particular email saying, at this point in time, I felt like you were yelling at me or you were being aggressive or you weren't allowing me to speak or whatever it was. Gotcha. But put in those terms, I felt as though. You're not necessarily stating it as a fact, but you're putting your complaint on the record. You're saying, this is how it was perceived by me, which no one can really argue with. That's how you perceive it. That's how you perceive it. And now there's a record of it. And that's really critical because as soon as the adjuster gets that record, now if they don't dispute it, that's just something that's going to become a fact. Now, bringing it back to the issue of having an issue with an aggressive adjuster, you want to make sure that that request is in writing, in particular a request for a change of case managers, because one, it's going to be much more likely that they're going to agree to do it. But two, if they don't do it, 
if you have requested in writing that you get a new case manager and they ignore your request, that's going to be an issue down the road when we bring the legal claim once they cut right. you off because now they're ignoring your request. They're not only being aggressive, but they're doing absolutely nothing to remedy the situation. And guess what? That's going to be a further argument for punitive damages as well. We're talking about the three ways to deal with an aggressive or bullying disability adjuster. Number three is this one, guys. Tell your doctors how the adjuster's aggressive or bullying behavior is impacting you and make sure they record it in their notes. So I, I tell that to each person that I speak with, whether they're my client or not. If they are relaying to me that they're having issues like that with the adjuster, um, they're telling me that the communication has either broken down or is just so aggressive that you know their heart rate jumps up. This is especially true with people who are dealing with, again, mental health issues or a combination of physical and mental health issues. But, but even, even if it's not mental health issues, even if it's a physical illness or injury that you're dealing with, and this is exacerbating uh, your condition in general and, and making you worse, make sure you relay that to your doctors. And I'll tell you why. Because at some point, when we get involved and go after the insurance company, your medical records are gonna be produced, right? The insurance company is gonna need to see them, and that's standard, that's fine. But once we start showing that you had actually told your doctor that this is impacting you in this way, well, guess what? What James was talking about, about punitive damages and going after the insurance company for bad faith, for doing that, for harming you, not only not treating you with respect, but harming you, that forms the basis, or at least one of the bases, of how we go after them for those punitive damages. So you do that. You do that if you have a psychologist, or you do that if you have a family doctor. Whoever it is you have, if it is impacting you, make sure you relay that to your doctor, that what the adjuster is doing is, is impacting you and explain how it is. And that's going to be a documentary record not in your writing, in the doctor's writing. Right. That has a lot of credibility if this thing ever went to, to the next step, which is the legal step that, that where we get involved. The other thing I would point out about that is if you don't go to your doctor and make the complaint, the argument on the other side is going to be, well, it couldn't have been that serious because you never saw anybody about it and you right. never complained about it. So you need to make sure that, number one, you're telling the insurance company and you're making the request there, and you're also telling your doctor so that it's recorded in two different places and they can't say it didn't have an impact. All this chat about doctors uh, dovetails nicely into our next question. Can your insurer force you to change doctors? We'll tackle that after a short break. 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca to reach out through email and simply disabilityrights.ca for more information and where to catch our radio show. Disability Law Show continues. Hang on. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors. They've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savannah and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to disabilityrights.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back to the Disability Law Show. I mentioned several times during the show we do each week ways you can reach out, the phone number, the website. There's also mydisabilityquestions.com. Lay your questions in there. These guys and a member of the team will answer them rather quickly, I might add. Sonia writes in from mydisabilityquestions.com. Guy says, a friend of mine uh, at work was robbed at gunpoint and assaulted two years ago. She was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and has been off work and on... Uh, been on and off work until she finally had a breakdown and was hospitalized about a year ago. She's been on a disability with her insurance company and now they want to have her go see uh, one of their therapists for treatment. She's very afraid to do that. She sees a psychiatrist regularly that she's very comfortable with and her concern is that switching psychiatrists could make her condition much worse. She expressed this concern to her insurance adjuster but they insist that if she wants to continue getting paid, she has to go to their psychiatrist. Is she allowed to refuse? Absolutely, and she should. 
She can absolutely refuse, and she absolutely shouldn't in this situation. The the really the most important message that I have for Sonia and for her friend is that your medical health, your medical treatment is so much more important than the legal process or your insurance claim. And so you have to make sure that you're getting the best treatment possible. And that means, especially when you're dealing with someone who has post-traumatic stress disorder, it is absolutely critical that you have a treatment provider that you're comfortable with. You're not going to make any progress if you don't trust the person totally. that's trying to treat you. Now that's true in virtually every context, but especially when you're dealing with someone who has as serious a condition as PTSD. That requires someone that you trust absolutely. So by all all means she should absolutely be refusing to change treatment providers. It is completely inappropriate for an insurance company to require that you change. They can ask. They're entitled to ask anything and if you agree with them, if you don't know any better and you agree to change your treatment provider even though you don't have to, well that's fine. They're allowed to make the request but that's as far as they can take it and if you say no that's the end of the story. If they are foolish enough to actually cut you off because you refuse to change treatment providers not see a different treatment provider. In other words, if you're seeing someone for your physical issues, but you also have psychological issues, and they say, you need to see someone for your psychological issues, that's fine. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about someone who is already seeing the appropriate expert, and they're saying, we want you to see a different person for the same kind of treatment. That they cannot do, and if they tie your denial or cutting off your benefits to that refusal, they're in big trouble. They cannot do that. They absolutely can't. And that is going to open them up to significant punitive damages. And they're, throw, they're throwing the monetary thing, continue getting paid, so more stress in You see life, that right? all the time. You see that quite a lot. And, and you know, I actually, this reminds me of a situation that happened a few weeks ago. Uh, a lady who, in fact, similar to this, had a psychiatrist, uh, had a, a good relationship with the psychiatrist. The insurance company says, you got to see someone else for treatments. When she told her psychiatrist the name of that other psychiatrist that the insurance company mentioned, red flags, immediate red flags, her own treating psychiatrist says, this has happened before with that insurance company, and guess what? That other psychiatrist ended up writing something to the insurance company that got the other person uh, cut off benefits. So you have to ask yourself, why is the insurance company insisting on right. you going to that particular person? So, you know, you got to be careful. James is right. You have no obligation to do that so long as you're getting the necessary treatments that you need to get. You do have an obligation under the policy to get treatments, right. to follow treatment recommendations. But if you have someone treating you already, you are under no obligation to go to the preferred treatment provider that the insurance company is sending you to. Because there's a reason why they want you to go there. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly right. You have to think, what is the motivation for them saying you should yeah. switch from this treatment provider who you're comfortable with to this other person that we're saying? And, you know, it's typically a situation like the one Savon just described with the client a few weeks back, where it's the same doctor gets referred all of these different patients from the same insurance company, and there's an ongoing relationship. Well, guess what? The insurance company is going to to choose doctors that give them reports that are favorable to them. And as soon as those reports stop being favorable, they're going to find themselves another doctor. And so say what you will, you know, it may well be that the doctor doesn't intend to have a bias, but at the end of the day, the insurance company is going to use someone who has a leaning towards them and not towards you. So you need to understand that. But really, at the end of the day, none of that matters. All that matters is that you're seeing someone who's qualified to treat you and that you are comfortable with. And if you are, then you should absolutely refuse any request to change. But don't get this confused with going to see their doctor as being asked to go to an assessment. That's, That's a totally different, different totally story. Different, right? the they are entitled, you yeah, they are entitled to choose their own doctors for assessment. Okay. An assessment just means someone's seeing you on one occasion and they're trying to figure out the extent of your disability. But they're not actually doing anything to try to make you better. They're not providing you with counseling or medication or any other form of treatment. All they are doing is they're providing an opinion to the insurance company about the extent of your disability and then often answering questions that pertain to issues issues in the claim, such as whether or not you're able to return to your occupation right. or things of that nature, but they're not providing treatment. So if it's for an assessment, sure, the insurance company can choose whoever they want to. That's fine, you have to go. 
But when we're talking about treatment, that's sacrosanct. You can't get in the way of that. Lots of good stuff there, guys. We're going to wrap it for today, the Disability Law Show. To reach out, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca. That is the email address we pulled that from. And you can simply go to disabilityrights.ca to find more information on the shows, the topics, and the radio show as well. And off the top, way at the beginning, we talked about pocketemploymentlawyer.ca. Go there for a section on disability as well. Catch you next time on the Disability Law Show. Thanks for joining us.